Good morning, everyone. Um, I have to change my sound setting because it's playing on my speakers. So I'm going to do that real quick, awkwardly in front of everyone. There we go. Vic. Um, it's interesting. So today we're talking about Ernesto Cardinal, who's like one of my heroes. And I was just listening to, I did this short run of broadcast called Deep Roots, and they were like audio essays. And I just listened to it and I was like, it's fucking great. So <laughs> it's really good. So not just because I'm a good writer, which is true, but because Cardinal is amazing. So I'm going to try to share the link of that. And we'd love, it'd be great to do more of those. But one of the things about him uh, that I appreciate is <clears throat> kind of like when we talked about Simone Weil, he is someone who lived into the tension, which as I'm thinking about this theme of discernment, which we're going to talk about more, really that's kind of the uh, part of the secret sauce of someone who can discern well is whether or not they lean in or away from the tension. And Cardinal kind of really, really did that. So do you, have you already engaged much of Nessa Cardinal or? Nope, much I, I haven't. <laughs> I'm looking on my bookshelf here. Uh, let's see. I don't think I have it right in front of me. I should have, I'm kind of running around like a chicken with my head cut off, but there's a book that I recommend as my favorite um, liberation theology text, The Gospel in Sola Taname, which um, the reason why I think it's my favorite among Latin American liberation theologians is it's not him doing theology on behalf of or in solidarity with the oppressed. It's him recounting basically Bible studies among the peasants uh, on the island of Solotaname where like there's this exchanges. So it's like you're reading like this almost like a transcript of conversations. So they read the mm -hmm. cleansing of the temple and then you'd hear like, uh, you know, Pablo talking about, you know, Jesus cleansing the temple. The earth is the temple. And so what God wants is to cleanse the earth of all the rich. That's how I read it. And Ernest was like, yeah, that's a good point. Like, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's like that. I'm like, fuck yeah. People, and a lot of these people were actual revolutionaries. So um, a little bit of the backstory of Ernesto and why I think it's good to think about him is in terms of discernment. He grew up in Nicaragua. I mean, he's probably best known as being kind of the most celebrated poet in Nicaragua and perhaps Latin America, or was um, for a time. And he studied it in New York at Columbia at the tail end of uh, the beat era. So he was buddies with some of the beat poets. Um, he was kind of a leftist, radical, and then he was part of an attempt to overthrow the government on one of the early attempts, and it failed. And he went into hiding. And during that, he had a religious conversion um, and became devout. And decided to embrace pacifism. And so from there he went, he decided he wanted to be a monk and he went and went to uh, Gethsemane where Thomas Merton was and Thomas Merton was his mentor and friend. And he went to return to Nicaragua and wanted to start this commune, this art commune, um, uh, liberationist commune on the island of Solotaname. And Merton was supposed to start it with him, but he couldn't, Merton could not get permission. There's um, some interesting exchanges and letters between the two of them where they talk about violence and nonviolence. And during this time, Cardinal was committed to pacifism, but as he saw more and more the people he cared about um, getting oppressed and killed, he changed his tune and became part of the Sandinista movement. Um, Kind of, he decided that revolutionary violence, even though it's messy and painful and a sort of rupture of what um, a good world should be, is still better than allowing repression. He also, um, in the early 70s, visited Cuba and was like hung out with Castro and all those folks and realized that that kind of revolution could really happen in Nicaragua. And so he became a revolutionary person when the Sandinistas finally uh, gained uh power um he was their first minister of culture so um capitalist folks might cynically refer to him as the chief propagandist 
But for him, it was about stirring up uh, an imagination for what a just society could look like. Um, but he was quickly disappointed because the Sandinistas were, um, you know, Daniel Ortega started gaining, uh, becoming more dictatorial and rich. And he's like, well, fuck this. And so he returned back to kind of his roots of poetry and began to double down on writing poetry and doing things like that. Um, and the, the Pope, when visiting Nicaragua somewhere in the 90s, uh, defrocked Cardinal and said, you're you know, too fucking militant, get out of here. And so that's kind of what happened with Cardinal. He kind of uh, finished his, his life writing poetry and talking about the kind of society he wanted to see and his sense of disappointment about it all. But to me, even though it's all very sad and, and the dream for a just Nicaragua was never realized, to me, that is the heart and soul of discernment. Instead of deciding from above his own perspective what society should be like and try to enforce it, he changed his mind because of the people around him. Mm -hmm. He was in a community where the, the peasants who helped him understand what the Bible really meant and that pushed him to take a stance that he would not, that was against his uh, 10,000 feet principles and so that he could kind of dive into it and then he continued yeah. to work for that. I'm willing to shift and change kind of with this heart of a poet, which to me is like a poet, a revolutionary, a priest, all those things mixed together, willing to be present to those who are suffering is kind of the sweet spot. So that's the quick and dirty mm -hmm. version of the story of Ernesto Cardinal. Pretty fucking badass. Um, for anyone who's yeah, listening to that, uh, you know, please leave your comments or questions. Um, I gave the, the fastest version of the Ernesto Carnal story as I could. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. Um, this, of course. To me, this quote, what's that? You kind of got all frozen for a second there. And you're still frozen. So let's see what happens. Um, for those who are listening. Uh, I think I'm freezing. Yeah, you, you were freezing. Can you hear? Or do you? Yeah, my internet is apparently connected to the wrong connection. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to switch it to the right connection and hopefully it doesn't bump me, but it should only take like a, a moment. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, this sort of, this question of discernment and to me, Cardinal embodies this in a way. If you really take discernment seriously, like how is it that God is present and what is what is what is the invitation here? It opens yourself up to violating these sorts of hard absolutes. So for a lot of mm -hmm. Christians, like in, in our circles, violence is considered an absolute. And so the idea that so people would say Cardinal failed because he was willing to take up violence. But to me, um, and this is kind of a, an interesting posture to take, I tend to think I am, on, in principle, I'm a pacifist, but discernment might lead me to not being a pacifist. And I have to be okay with that mm -hmm. because that's the heart of discernment is that you don't assume you already know. If you assume you already know how everything's supposed to be and go, then you're basically not discerning <laughs> that's kind of the danger yeah, that's, not and why it's so, <laughs> that's why it's so subversive to engage in that kind of discernment yeah i i do think that so i do think that a lot of times that we get stuck in i mean in a lot of not not just uh in this but basically in everything we get stuck in this idea that there's binaries between two different points of view and that's not actually true. And so like pacifism tends to fall into this idea of nonviolence, which is not actually so like nonviolence is a passive form of reacting to violence. But there is also active forms of reacting to violence, which is is, is called anti-violence. It's mm -hmm. like the same thing as anti-racism. Mm -hmm. um, 
like the actual active pursuit of ending violence and honestly act like an active response is takes a lot more discernment because mm -hmm. um every situation is different if 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 a passive response worked in every situation then that's also like not i don't know pa like pa passivism kind of is not discernment either or taking a passive stance is not discernment it's allowing things to happen without like actually engaging i guess yeah well and this is the thing when people when you say violence and nonviolence, people already have um those categories filled out in their head about what it's supposed to look like and so yeah they think violence is we need to get a get a bunch of uh, semi-automatic rifles and storm the capital and they think mm -hmm. nonviolence is like kind of Gandhi. And there's a whole range of options of ways of acting in the world that people don't even consider. And to me, discernment is about being open to things you would never consider otherwise. So mm -hmm. uh, the range, the sort of strict binary of what we think of as violence and nonviolence is just too small. So like, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's where people like, they try to want to sort it into one of two categories. So if you're, if you have a bunch of tanks and you sneak in and you destroy the fuck out of those things, that you get a lot of passers like, oh, you destroyed property, that's violence. I'm like, why? <laughs> like, why is that? <laughs> why? I mean, you know, super so, gluing, why can't we just super glue all the, you know, break into a compound and like, like, like throw buckets of super glue on soldiers and get them stuck there? Like, there's all kinds of fucking things we could do. Why do we have to think about it in terms of these strict things? And so, yeah. I'm not really I mean, advocating throwing super glue. Yeah, it's just the first yeah, random thing that came to my head. <laughs> super soak with super glue in it. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, that I, I, I mean, I do think that you're pointing something out there with like the idea of destruction of property is in fact violence. However, like the destruction of property from another point of view, like the destruction of of areas where there's a lot of tents because there's unhoused people there and cities going in and destroying those, like that is an act of violence against mm -hmm. a, a marginalized group of people. Um, and to act in anti-violence means to be on the side of those marginalized people and working in a way that it, that at least reduces <laughs> that type of violence mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that might that might include another form of violence that maybe doesn't hurt people like property isn't people um and whenever you can like i don't know it's like uh like property isn't people but if a city destroys um <laughs> if a city destroys one tent of an unhoused person like that is a lot larger of an act of violence than um destruction of property that like that's insured and like all this like oh yeah this it's is not the, it's not the same thing no and this is where social analysis is a part of discernment and like people really need to have sharper and sharper analysis so like there's and 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 part of what our social systems and institutions do in kind of shaping our subjectivity, like our way of perceiving the world is um, kind of normalizing things, some things and not other things. So the mm -hmm. tent thing. So under kind of the default uh, setting of our operating system that's put into us, uh, we would look at uh, police taking a, a a homeless person's tent and like throwing it away as like, well, that's a bummer. Um, but if you take and burn down uh, the mayor's summer house, holy fuck, like they get like that about it. And they think of like yeah. in terms of value and worth and legitimacy and respectability and ownership, r property rights and all these stuffs are, are so assumed that people think that it's simple and straightforward the level of complexity to understand the legitimacy of someone having a second home that they own in perpetuity that they can pass on to their descendants forever um, is a 
fucking abstract set of concepts that have it takes a lot of work to get to that to be an assumption mm -hmm. and to then somehow think some person who's experiencing homelessness having their tent taken off of a public park um and thrown away uh it takes a lot of assumptions to somehow think that the deprivation of someone who is little is not a big deal where at rather than the extraction of overabundance of wealth from someone who has ill-gotten gains, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. the number of things that are like discernment requires that we're willing to look at that without the same as like in a way that antagonizes the assumptions of our society so that we can say, well, what, how do we attend to who is most oppressed in this moment? Which is what Cardinal did. It's why it's mm -hmm. fucking awesome. Even if I'm like, oh, Sandinista revolution. I mean, I loved Sandinista volume one and two from the clash, but I don't know if I could take up arms. Like that's what discernment opens you up to. You have to be willing to do yeah. that. Of course. Yeah. Um, which is why people don't like us talking about the way we talk about discernment and spiritualize all this political shit. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, but that's, um, to me, that's the basis of like spirituality is it's it's not just like how you feel about the idea of the of the divine it's like how do you actually interact and feel connected with the world around you and to um to to just put it on this like weird binary of i guess it's not a binary it's just like a messed up understanding that spirituality has to do with uh your connection with the divine and not connected to like how you interact and treat other people mm -hmm. which by the way isn't is not a it's not a christian value if you, re you read the bible but apparently it's in bread in a quote christian nation so it's like yeah spirituality and how you understand and treat other people is one and the same yeah um here's a little quote like there's all sorts of wonderful uh, you know, he's a poet, so there's all sorts of quotes from him. But oh, I'm sure. um, one of the things that's great is he, you know, and this isn't a, exactly a novel idea, but he embodied it so well. He wrote that what Marxism calls atheism is basically the negation of an idol, which sometimes bears the name of God. And so, again, this is the sort of this posture of discernment. It's like mm -hmm. this priest, very devout. Like if you read some of his stuff, he... He wasn't just masquerading as a devout Catholic. Uh, he, uh -huh. he was. He believed in the Holy Spirit's operating work in the world in a very profound and powerful way. Um, you know, he studied the Gospels like purposefully and thoughtfully and was very committed to it. And he understood that the atheism of Marxism is a type of faithfulness because it's smashing the idol that has been named God, uh -huh. which we we have had a lot of memes that kind of point towards that. And to me, again, that's the heart of discernment. Like, are you willing to allow your experience of the spirit to subvert your beliefs about God? It's kind of like... I mean, that's, yeah, that, that's why we take on evangelicalism so often is because uh, a lot of it is the worship of a person's idea of God and not the worship of an actual, like, engaging God. Like, it, it's, it, they've made it... it I, I'm, speak, I'm speaking from experience because I was an mm -hmm. event hardcore evangelical for most of yeah. my adult life so like this mm -hmm. this was me and i'm pretty sure i wasn't the only one but um it, you, you're not actually like worshiping a god that actually exists you're worshiping a god that you believe you you know that is confined to this one book and, and it is a form of idolatry of and placing yourself <laughs> it's literally placing yourself and your understanding of the divine above the divine <laughs> and it's like it just it, it has so many unintended negative effects because it's so much like it, it is literally creating a god in your own image that you're worshiping yeah and i mean think how bizarre it is the evangelical shtick about <clears throat> Jesus wants you to have a personal relationship with him and you need to let him into your heart. Okay. Do that. And then it's like, you go to Jesus, like Jesus, help me figure out how to live well. It's like, 
I wrote, this is all written down a couple thousand years ago. Fucking read the book. <laughs> Do what it says. But Jesus, yeah, I just exist now to remind you that I wrote a book. <laughs> that's kind of, that's like the whole thing. The whole, I, that was the first thing I, I always would listen to people say personal issue with Jesus. And then I'd see how they enacted that. I'm like, yeah, none of this makes any damn sense. And I have to decide which thing to take more seriously here because there's a conflict at the heart of this sort of weird dichotomy with an evangelism. And Mm -hmm. I end up banking towards this pure subjectivity of like, how do you experience the living God? I mean, there's no way around pure subjectivity, no matter what you look at, how you look at it, because everything is still going to be filtered through your own understanding, your own experience, your own language, how... Mm -hmm your brain actually develops around the language that you're like raised in. Like it Mm -hmm. literally affects the way that you form ideas. So like, (laughs) even if God came down and spoke directly to you, like it's still going to have a subjective outcome (laughs) because it's because that's just how people are. And like, that's not, that's not a bad thing. I I think in evangelical is what is, it's just what it is. It's just what it is. And in evangelicalism, they, it's it's almost like needing to take away the human part of humanity to be like, this is God and God always shows up this way. And this is how you experience God. And it's like, no, that's that 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 can't hold true like at all. So why why hold on to it <laughs> in su- such strong terms? Um, you just sound like a homo homo right now just postmoderning all over the place <laughs> um yeah, well i had four years of a bible college undergrad where they uh tried to tear down postmodernism. so <laughs> i remember yeah i had my there it was so funny the more they <clears throat> the more they did that like in my undergrad and then also in seminary the more i'm like oh yeah this way of being so purely subjected makes a lot of sense. So they were like yeah, pushing me. They were trying to convince me of something. And I was, you know, I, maybe it's just because I'm oppositional defiant. I'm like, oh, yeah, what you're against, I guess I'm for because that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I entered seminary evangelical and, and left, you know, still maybe a little bit evangelical, but a, a leftist for sure. And then the uh-huh. evangelism slipped away over time. Um. I want to read this uh, again for maybe I should do the commercial first. Uh, let's see. I'll put this up for folks who are watching um, either they're live or after the fact um, we are in fundraising season and <clears throat> woohoo. And this is, you know, this is important stuff because we do these broadcasts. We have a spiritual direction uh, training program in the new year. We're going to do a bunch of stuff um, around a call to solidarity around LGBTQ inclusion um, that we think is vitally important. Um, uh, creating spaces, a little different different groups for discernment around common causes. Um, a lot of stuff. And we really want to live into this sort of thing we're talking about more and more and create space for other people to do that. And so if you want to help us out, we're trying to raise a minimum of $20,000 by the end of the year, which is the most we try to do in a, in a fundraising season. Um, but we want we can get at it. We believe we can get it. Um, in addition to this, we want 25 new sustaining members to commit to giving monthly through 2023. Um, visit propheticimagination.org for more information. If you go there, there's a GoFundMe link. And if you click that link, there's a couple of videos on that page that explain what we're doing in the year ahead, but then also kind of a three-phase plan of where it's all heading, which is really about how can we become an organization that notices uh, kind of where the, the spirit's doing stuff in the world and then creating capacity and space. So that's not centered on us, but we're helping to activate and encourage and nurture, and support uh, the sort of liberationist spirituality that we're talking about. We really want to yep. be about that work um, because You'd think, since that's to me the heart of Christianity as it's supposed to be, anyways, there'd be a lot of that going on, and there's just just not a lot, <laughs> especially in comparison to mm-hmm. authoritarian shit. So, if you, 
So give us some money and be a part yep. of what we're doing. Uh, I want to read a little poem since Cardinal is a poet. It seems weird to not, at least. Um, this one is, this is a, a tran English translation of one of his poems that is itself a paraphrase of Psalm 5. So, <clears throat> give ear to my words, O Lord, hearken unto my moaning, pay heed to my protest, for you are not a God friendly to dictators, neither are you a partisan of their politics, nor are you influenced by their propaganda, neither are you in league with the gangster. There is no sincerity in their speeches, nor in their press releases. They speak of peace in their speeches, while they increase their war production. They speak of peace at peace conferences and secretly prepare for war. Their lying radios roar into the night. Their desks are strewn with criminal intentions and sinister reports, but you will deliver me from their plans. They speak through the mouth of the submachine gun. Their flashing tongues are bayonets. Punish them, O Lord. Thwart them in their policies, confuse their memorandums, obstruct their programs. At the hour of alarm, you shall be with me. You shall be my refuge on the day of the bomb. To him who believes not in the lies of their commercial messages, nor in their public publicity campaigns, nor in their political campaigns, you will give your blessing. With love do you encompass him as with armor-plated tanks. Oh, Ernesto. Um, I mean, that's a pretty good, like, uh, I don't know, that's, that's a part of it. Modern, yeah, it, like, if you want to, if you want to understand a psalm brought into current times, that's a pretty good example. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's embodying that what's going on, but like, instead of chariots, you know, it, it's, mm -hmm. um, interestingly, so back in the day, I did this podcast called the Iconocast, and we had Ernesto Cardinal lined up. He's passed away now, but had him lined up uh, to be interviewed. And so we had, he agreed. He said, if, as long as he could do it in Spanish, even though he speaks in, spoke English. And so we had it lined up where so he's going to be interviewed in Spanish and then we'd translate it. And so there'd be a kind of a all mm -hmm. in Spanish. And then right after it'd be like the English translation. Um, and it was going to be a real big deal. And then, uh, he said, then he said, like, no, I decided to retire from, from public life. And so like, fuck, he was like, my, <laughs> he was my, the one, the one I most, he was on the top of my list of people to interview. Yeah. And I got to interview, yeah. you know, James Cone and Cornell West and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Starhawk, all sorts of really badass people, tons of people, Noam Chomsky, got to interview all those people, but like Cardinal was on the top of my list and he slipped away. Got slipped away. away yeah into the night um so <laughs> so that was i was so close finding that interview but um well we're pretty much we're at, at time, time. <laughs> yeah, and i have to rush to my dissertation class i'm supposed to propose on something that i'm not prepared for uh i have got this <laughs> yeah. so anyways um We'll see y'all, everyone, next week. I think next week, I don't know. I don't know what the theme is. We'll we'll figure it out between now and figure Monday. Yep. Well, Monday, I'll share a mystical experience. Wednesday, we'll talk about the theme itself. That's kind of like the, the mystical experience kind of ho helps open up. And then on Friday, we'll talk about a figure, kind of like we did today with Father Ernesto Carno. So we'll see y'all next week. Sounds great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.